Hi, Dad. This is a book that I'm reading on the recommendation of our neighbor. Uh, it's called The Last Fighting Tommy. It's, it's an autobiography co-written by a fellow named Harry Patch and Richard Von Emden. Richard, uh, Harry Patch is 110 years old, and he's the last uh, survivor of World War I of those who fought. Uh, he was born in 1898 in West in western part of England, and I'm going to read a section of it that I think uh, you'll enjoy. Uh, it made me think of you anyway that you would enjoy this. This is the Battle of Paskendale, which happened in 1917, where the Brits were um, pushing back the Germans in late August. And uh, here's here's how it goes. Our guns opening bombardment bombardment had begun with an almighty clap of thunder. You can't describe the noise. You can't. But it was just enough to take your breath away. It was ferocious, and much of it was dropping not far that not that far ahead of us as the barrage crept forward with the infantry behind. There was an officer going down the line. I say line. We were effectively out in the open. He had his drawn revolver, and I got the distinct impression by the set look on his face that anyone who didn't go over would be shot for cowardice where they stood. On the far side of the flooded stream, we assembled. It's now 4.15 a.m., by the way. Uh, they just trekked 20 miles to get to this uh, spot where they're going to attack. Uh, there was a look of apprehension in everyone's eyes and horror in a few. There was white tape laid there so we knew where to stand and in which direction we were expected to go. Otherwise, we might wander off course or fall into a shell hole. It was just shell holes and the team made its way forward into a line. It was absolutely sickening to see your own dead and wounded, some calling for stretcher bearers, others semi-conscious and beyond all help and the German wounded lying about too, and you couldn't help to stop to talk to see them. I saw one German. I should think he'd been dead some time. Well, a shell had hit him, and all his side and his back were ripped up, and his stomach was out on the floor. It was a horrible sight. Others were just blown to pieces. It wasn't a case of seeing them with a nice bullet hole in their tunic, far from it. And there I was, only 19 years old. I felt sick. So that's just a little excerpt. Um, I'll read more later, I think, see how this recording goes. Bye. Okay, I'm back. Uh, this is a section, I'm jumping ahead, where he describes his Lewis gun team. Lewis gun was a large uh, automatic rifle that uh, four guys operated, and they had three teams. So it starts with... Uh, number four on the Lewis gun and I were pipe smokers. So so the ounce of tobacco was cut in half. Half was mine and half was his. The 40 cigarettes we divided among the other three, 13 each, and they used to take it in turns who should have the odd one. Cakes, chocolates, anything else were all divided. If you had a pair of clean socks and a fellow had soles, had socks with holes in them, he'd have the clean socks and throw the others away. And that was the spirit that was within that team. There was no question of sharing with anyone else. Like the bombers, they must look after themselves. I remember Bob had a good thick sweater that came that came one time, and whoever was out on lookout that night had the sweater to put on. You talked to your mates in the Lewis gun team. There was always a certain amount of emotional chatter, nerves. Shall we get through tomorrow or shall we shall we get a packet? I'm going up to the line tonight, and am I coming back? It's getting dark. Okay, everything may be quiet, but are you going to see the sun come up in the morning? That was why the comradeship was so important. Anyone who tells you that in the trenches they weren't scared, he's a... This is a picture of Harry Patch. I'm fast-forwarding to his uh, departure from the military in 1919, and this is what he describes. Just a short bit. Soon enough, we got our orders to leave the Isle of Wight, and we were taken aboard to a ship for Gosport, where we, were to, where we were to stay for one night. It was a wintry March evening when we got there, to be greeted by the news that we would have no blankets that night. 
The boys were not having that. We weren't going to sleep without anything to cover us up, and we started to create about it. The sergeant in charge said, Well, where are you from, anyway? Actually, you know what? I should be doing this in a British accent. Let's see. Well, where are you from, anyway? We told him, We're the Duke of Cornwalls from the Isle of Wight. Yes, yeah, I can't do a military accent and British at the same time. Anyway, uh, we don't want any trouble. We'll get some blankets for you. So I suppose you must have heard about the incident. We noticed straight away that none of the distinctive uh, blankets had the distinctive government s stamp on them. And so by the time we left, we had sold all of them. There were plenty of girls around the camp. Well, to put it in plain English, they were prostitutes. So I can't say that all the blankets were sold for money. From Gosport, we went to Fovent on to Salisbury Plain, which we've all been to. Aaron and I and the girls. And that's where I got my DMOB papers. We were sent to the quartermaster store and given our civilian clothes, and all the same ill-fitting, or rather, it would be more accurate to say they fitted where they touched. We were then handed to a travel warrant, uh, handed a travel warrant and set free. There was a light railway going from Fovent to Salisbury, where we took a main line to wherever we were going. I headed for the city of Bath and my home.